Good evening. I'm Anne-Marie Lipinski from the Neiman Foundation for Journalism at Harvard, and I'm delighted to welcome you to a conversation with the winners of the 2021 J. Anthony Lucas Prize. As we gather tonight, we invite you to leave a post in the chat telling us where you're watching from, and if you'd like, tell us what you're reading. Together with our colleagues at the Columbia Journalism School, Neiman presents these awards each year to the best of American nonfiction books, both published and in progress, that demonstrate the literary grace, serious research, and social concern that characterize the work of the award's namesake. Along with the Mark Linton History Prize, these awards have celebrated some of the nation's most extraordinary authors and writing of the past two decades. Tony Lucas was the winner of two Pulitzer Prizes, the first in 1968 for investigative reporting at the New York Times. His second Pulitzer came 18 years later for Common Ground, a turbulent decade in the lives of three American families his landmark book about school desegregation and busing in Boston. It remains for many journalists and authors, a standard bearer for deeply reported long form narrative. Tony's work had many virtues, but I wanted to mention just one that has special resonance today. He listened without judgment, without accusation, said Colin Diver, one of the subjects of Common Ground. In the excruciating, almost obsessive precision of his research, he reminded us of the cleansing power of truth. In his relish for the richness of his material, he taught us there can be a richness, even a kind of nobility, in the ordinariness of everyday life. I would like to express my gratitude to the Linton family, especially Lily and Michael, for their ongoing support of this prize project and to the teams of people at Columbia and Neiman led by Abby Wright and Christine Kay. And deepest thanks to this year's prize judges who took on a huge assignment. Miriam Powell, Sarah Broom, Alex Kotlowitz, Julia Keller, Tyler Anbinder, Leon Dash, Peter Ganay, Pamela Newkirk, and Rachel Louise Snyder. I now welcome my colleague, Annette Gordon-Reed, the Pulitzer Prize winning historian, Carl M. Loeb, University Professor at Harvard, and a new member of the Lucas Prize Board. She will moderate the conversation with the prize winners. Professor Gordon-Reed. Thank you very much for that introduction. And I'm very happy to be here with the winners of the J. Anthony Lucas Work in Progress Awards and the Book Prize Awards as well. I'm going to introduce them now and we're going to have a discussion. Going alphabetically, Emily Dufton, who's a writer, and drug historian and researcher who's based near Washington, D.C., wins the J. Anthony Lucas Work in Progress Award for Addiction, Inc., How the Corporate Takeover of America's Treatment Industry Created a Profitable Epidemic. Next, we have Casey Parker, a freelance reporter who covers people, poverty, and education, wins for her book, The Diary of a Misfit. Now for the book prize winners, the J. Anthony Lucas Book Prize goes to Jessica Goudeau, who won for After the Last Border, Two Families and the Story of Refuge in America. And finally, the Mark Litton History Prize winner, William G. Thomas III, the John and Catherine Angle Chair in the Humanities and Professor of History at the University of Nebraska, won for A Question of Freedom, the families who challenged slavery from the nation's founding to the Civil War. Congratulations to all of you. I'd like to ask of you, all of you to start. It's a big deal to undertake writing a book, committing yourself to living with a subject for years at a time. What was the spark that made you decide to write the book about, your, the, about the subject that about which you wrote and tell us a little bit about your subjects. If we could start with Emily. Sure. Um, and it's such an honor to speak to you, uh, Professor Gordon-Reed. As a historian, your work is incredible and uh, uh, a real inspiration and light <laughs> for people like me. So thank you. I'm so pleased to be here. Uh, my work started with the death of a friend uh, from high school who hanged himself in uh, the fall of 2016. His death was not 
specifically drug related, but I still felt that he was potentially a victim of the opioid epidemic because he had been using opioids for about 15 years prior to his death. Mm -hmm. So I began researching why he had died and how he could have been saved. And I, um, I've been a drug historian now for about uh, 10 years and I have a lot of connections to uh, clinicians and doctors who are familiar with this field. And I ask them what I could have done or what we could have done to save my friend. And they all said, well, you know, he really should have been on medication assisted treatment, uh, which is one of the three FDA approved drugs for opioid dependence, which is methadone, buprenorphine or naltrexone. Mm -hmm. And if he had been on one of these three FDA approved drugs, which are considered the gold standard of opioid addiction treatment, he would have possibly been okay. And I was shocked by this because I've been studying drug addiction now for a decade and there is no unanimity of opinion about anything when it comes to drug history, mm -hmm. treatment, or an understanding of the field. And I was shocked by this. So I began researching the history of, of these three drugs, uh, methadone, buprenorphine, and naltrexone. Uh, buprenorphine you might be familiar with because recently the Biden administration has actually loosened restrictions on the availability of this drug. So it's been in the news actually like earlier this week. Uh, so maybe you've heard the, maybe you've heard the word yes. buprenorphine, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> And I realized that these three drugs are old. Methadone was uh, developed by Germany uh, during yes. World War II as a morphine substitute. Buprenorphine and naltrexone were both synthesized in the mid 1960s. They're old drugs that are being marketed as new drugs and as the cure for an opioid epidemic whose overdose is numbered over 90,000 in the past year. And I realized this is not necessarily uh, the cure. This is not necessarily so the solution. And I began researching the history of these three substances and realized that this idea of them as being the gold standard is actually quite convoluted. There's a little bit of, a, of, of well, corruption and the sort of drive towards privatization in the healthcare industry that has resulted in a situation where we have a very large overdose epidemic. And the best possible response that we can have to it is insufficient, expensive, and old. My friend could not have necessarily been saved by these drugs. We need a larger and more holistic response. And that is sort of the birth of where this, uh, this project has come from. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Casey? Yes, ma'am. Uh, to echo Emily, thank you so much for being here. It's a huge honor to share this digital space with you. Uh, and like Emily, my project started for a personal reason. Um, back in 2001, I came out as gay and I was living in Mississippi at the time. And after I did, my pastor asked God basically to kill me. He did like a save her and take her prayer. Mm -hmm. And the idea was like that I would ask forgiveness and die immediately. And my mother wrote a letter to every professor at my college telling them that I was gay. I was going to go to hell and it was the school's fault and that every time she thought about me she wanted to throw up and um so i went home the summer after my freshman year of college to try to prove to my family that i wasn't evil and on the fourth of july we were having like a barbecue dinner and my uncle kept like staring at me over the meat and said uh have you ever heard of sodom and gomorrah and I was like, I'm alive in Louisiana, like I've heard of Sodom and Gomorrah. Mm -hmm. And he was said, uh, God destroyed a whole nation to get rid of homosexuality. What makes you think he wouldn't destroy you? Mm -hmm. And my mom got really upset and ran to the bathroom and started crying. And uh, I ran in there after her and I was like, uh, at the time I, was, I thought I could maybe fix it. And so I told her I wasn't gonna be gay anymore. And my grandma came in there and said a bunch of words that I can't say on C-SPAN. Um, but essentially she told her like to get over it. And then my grandma pulled me aside that afternoon and said, I grew up across the street from a woman who lived as a man. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what? Like my grandma uh, was a sharecropper and she grew up in rural Louisiana and it, that just was outside of my understanding of what rural Louisiana could be like. And she said um, that he played country music and he was like the star of her street. And there was a mystery that um, 
the woman who raised him was named Jewel Ella. She was a Native American woman. And on her deathbed, Jewel Ellis pulled my great grandmother like down into her deathbed and was like, Rita Mae, Roy is as much a woman as you or I ever was. And then she confessed that she had stolen him supposedly from an abusive family in Arkansas and changed him into a boy and then raised him in this tiny town where they also picked cotton. Mm -hmm. And my grandma was like, I want you to go to Delhi and find out what happened. And uh, that was 20 years ago. And I, like, my book is also about cotton and family and religion and a bunch of other things, but that was the inciting incident. Mm -hmm. now, we'll go to get back to the books later. It's just, a, this is a preliminary matters here. Um, Jessica? Yeah, you know, I think, um, first of all, I agree with Emily and Casey. Um, thank you so much for having us tonight. And I know so many people put so much work into this, especially in the middle of a pandemic when it just feels like the work is nonstop. And I just can't, I could not be more grateful to be here tonight. So thank you. Um, for me as well, this is relational. So um, echoing a little bit of what Emily said, I worked at a, I started a nonprofit while I was in graduate school for years and have known former refugees for more than a decade and was sitting here in Austin, Texas when the rhetoric changed around the country and also in our state. And I realized that there was a role for a mediator who had long-term relationships with refugees, but is not herself a refugee. And so I feel like my job in this book was to hide what needed to be hidden and to tell what needed to be told. And so it was from that vantage point of someone who has been in relationship with these people for a long time. And for me, this could not be possible without the two women who took two years to tell their story. So um, this really, for, I wanna make sure that I'm centering Muna and Hasna, and those are the pseudonyms that these women use, but just to, their, their uncompromising courage and wanting the world to know what happened in Myanmar and what is still happening in Myanmar and Syria. Um, I was so honored to be a part of that process with them. Will? Yeah, thank you. Um... Again, thank you for this evening. It's wonderful to be to be here with you all, and uh, thank you to the Lucas Prizes and the Neiman Foundation and Columbia University. Um, I I started in a very academic way. I uh, had stumbled upon a reference to a Supreme Court case in 1813 um, that was a freedom suit, um, a suit brought by an enslaved person for their freedom and for their child's freedom. And I did not know much about freedom suits at the time. I knew, of course, about the Dred Scott case, the infamous, notorious, probably the most notorious case in American uh, history. Um, but that was much later. That's right before the Civil War. And here was this freedom suit earlier and in American history. And I went to the National Archives and um, somewhat on a on a lark, I asked for the case file from the archivists at the National Archives, and they brought out an index that had all of the cases brought before the DC court in that early period. And when I opened it to the uh, 1813 date and that court term, it became clear that the Queen family who brought that freedom suit um, brought five, six, seven, eight other freedom suits. And so what began as a story of one freedom suit quickly became a story of a family's pursuit of freedom across many generations. And then as I traced that case back in time to the Maryland earlier history, hundreds of freedom suits that I just didn't know uh, existed. And so it changed my entire understanding of, of uh, this period, of the instability of slavery and the law, and of how important these cases were uh, collectively and individually. Mm -hmm. um, as I started to pull the threads of the freedom suits, I tried to follow them back in time and forward in time. I wanted to know what, what happened to Mina Queen, who lost her freedom suit in the Supreme Court? What happened to her daughter, Louisa Queen? What happened to their descendants? And as I uh, pursued this re research, it also became clear that my family, 
um, in Prince George's County at about that time was involved in some of these freedom suits. They were lawyers and judges mm -hmm. and uh, they defended slaveholders and they were slaveholders themselves. And so I had to reckon with this history uh, throughout the research. And um, as I did so, I came into contact with all of the families who, uh, the descendants of the families who sued for freedom, mm -hmm. the Queens, uh, the Mahoney's and the Shorters and the Thomases and the Duckets. And, and those conversations um, today made this history um, palpable and real in a way that I'd not experienced before. And that kept me going mm -hmm. through this entire, uh, through this entire work. Mm -hmm. Emily, you describe yourself as a, as a drug researcher, a historian uh, of drug, drugs. Um, what is the most important lesson you've learned during, I mean, during this book, but just the overall in looking at this particular industry? Because it's, it's a controversial industry. I mean, they're love it or hate it. People admire some aspects of it and are, you know, concerned about others. What, what do you, what, what is the primary thing you've learned about it? And what do you think about the industry as a whole? Well, that's a great question. And um, I guess I would, I would say this from my experience, not only researching uh, this field, which is sort of the, the opioid addiction medication industry, but from my previous book as well, which was about uh, cannabis activism, both for and against the drug. And the biggest takeaway that I've gotten is that drugs themselves, of course, are inert substances. They, they exist on their own and they're, they're powders or they're leaves or they're liquid or they're tinctures. They do nothing on their own. But as soon as they are imbibed into the human body and they have some kind of effect, a psychoactive effect, that is when suddenly there is a need for either legislative or moralistic control over them. And that is where we start to burden them with a lot of concepts and ideas. Either these things are good or they are bad and their users are good or they are bad. And the idea that uh, medication can be used specifically to control or redact kind of the idea of addiction itself is a really fascinating one. You know, I'm still quite early into this process. This pandemic has really screwed up my research. No, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, like uh, there's, I can't get into archives. I, I can't get into presidential libraries. The, mm -hmm. the secrets lying in the Nixon and Reagan mm -hmm. libraries in California are, are, are at, at the moment closed off to me. But I have learned that, to me at least as a researcher, drugs are about the most interesting things in the entire world because there are human characteristics that we place upon these inert substances and we demand mm -hmm. a lot from them and we place a lot of meaning upon them. Mm -hmm. And discovering or sort of elucidating the meaning surrounding those as far as specifically political ideas are concerned is a very prominent project uh, and, and one that I really enjoy doing. And uh, I guess in one way, I guess pot really is a gateway drug because my first book was about marijuana and now I'm researching opioids, <laughs> so here I am. <laughs> so why do we have such a strange, well, you're describing this, this sort of ambivalent, you know, relationship with drugs, with the idea of, well, intoxicants, but also drugs as things that are, you know, that can solve addiction or create addiction. Why do we have this, this connection to it, our, this response to drugs. And it's specifically about the response to one aspect of drug addiction, which is, which is to, to opioid addiction. Uh, yes. There are no other medications that are specifically available for addiction to any other substance. We're, we're starting to kind of begin to understand potentially the scientific uh, sort of workaround for other substances. Uh, one substance is actually used as well for uh, opioid addiction, naltrexone, may potentially be useful for um, methamphetamine addiction as well. But mm -hmm. Opioid addiction has been a problem in the United States since the late 19th century. We have had three distinct bouts of opioid overdose epidemics in the uh, early 1900s, in the 1970s, in the peak in 1971, and now today. And mm -hmm. 
primarily these have been iatrogenic, which means that they have been uh, sort of fomented by the medical industry. We see this now with Oxycontin. Mm -hmm. uh, we saw this back in the 19th century with widespread uh, prescriptions of, of, of morphine. Uh, but opioids are such a they weigh very heavily, I think, on the American psyche, because this is a drug that people return to time and time again in the in ways that we don't necessarily return to with other substances. Mm -hmm. But it's also a drug family that has a substitution theory, mm -hmm. uh, which is if you give these, you know, people who are struggling with opioid dependency, opioids that are housed in the family of medicine, as opposed to the family of illicit <laughs> drugs, they can continue to live these very productive lives. We don't have a lot of other symptoms or situations where that is a, an, an, an issue. Mm -hmm. um, is it necessarily the solution? Mm -hmm. I know people for whom methadone, buprenorphine, and naltrexone have essentially saved their lives. And this book is in no way a denunciation of these substances. Mm -hmm. It is, however, a denunciation of the system in which these substances exist. And their availability to people who are desperately in need of them. Mm -hmm. We have a problem right now over the past 20 years where opioids have been widely available. Mm -hmm. uh, and now we're moving into a situation where opioids are actually more powerful because fentanyl has uh, basically adulterated the illicit drug supply in almost all forms of illicit substances. Mm -hmm. We do need something that is going to combat this problem because overdoses are a very serious problem. Mm -hmm to make them more available and to make drug treatment more holistic, uh, to sort of treat the whole human problem that undermines addiction or that underlies addiction, I think would be a better solution than simply allowing someone to, you know, pay a lot of money for one specific substance, which would be a substitution for whatever, whatever it was that they were taking on the street. Mm -hmm. And certainly moving at your, out of the criminal justice system, is that, mm -hmm. is the Oh yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, the criminal justice system doesn't really do anything for addiction, mm -hmm. and it never has. And this has been a debate since the 1920s, but we see the ramifications specifically of the Reagan war on drugs now, this 30-year, 40-year, going on 40-year war, where we have treated uh, those struggling with dependence and addiction with punitive ramifications. Uh, we decided to just throw them in jail, which of course is going to do uh, nothing for the situation. Um, there has to be a better solution. Yeah, yeah. Casey, um, yours is a very personal story. I've just come off of writing a memoir myself, uh, something that I don't typically, that's not my typical area, not my typical way of working, and it was somewhat something of an adjustment to make. Um, In Texas, right? <laughs> pardon me? Yes, yes. Um, your book is described as a part memoir and part investigative reporting. What was the easier part to do? Uh, was oh it difficult God. for you? Was it difficult for you to 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 go into the the realm of memoir and talk about yourself, um, and, and or the there. investigative part? I had to be dragged there. Um, I definitely. Oh, I I've been working on it for more than a decade, and at different times, people would ask me to put myself in it, and I really did not want to. And actually, we filmed everything, and um, the person who went with me to film everything would make me do these like video interviews at the end of every night. And I look like such a jerk in all of them because I hate being interviewed. Sorry, <laughs> professor. <laughs> um, I, like to, I like to do the questioning and I like to disappear in the room. And mm -hmm. um, I, I just said no for a long time. And eventually people talked me into to believing it was the best version of the story that um, in, in part because I went down there to learn about Roy, but but I learned a ton about my family and and the reasons I went down there were personal and the people. It's a really tiny town, so it's populated by my family. Mm -hmm. But I still I I just got edits back from my editor on my first draft, and and some of them are about <laughs> about probing myself further, and I just found it find it really difficult it's much easier and more interesting to me to write other about other people mm -hmm. so is it is it an hesitancy about revealing yourself is it about uh talking about family because if memoir the difficulty for me is that memoir is not just about you it's about your relationship with other people <laughs> you know and how, how they fit in all of this. 
I'm not personally private, but uh, I'm I'm surrounded by private people. Yeah. But um, most of the people, most of my family members, unfortunately, um, have died since I started working on it, so they're not around to protest anymore. But um, mm -hmm. I, I don't think they would anyway. They love to talk, but um, it's not that. I just find that I'm less interesting than mm -hmm. other people. Interesting to me, mm -hmm. and. Um, to me, the fun writing is the worst part of writing. And to me, the most fun part is getting to know somebody and getting to learn everything about a place. And I already know enough about myself. It's not, although I don't know, actually I don't, but probably my, the, the note I wrote back to my editor today is I don't know myself. So uh, maybe I don't, but um, yeah, I, I, you know, I'm a journalist. I, I write newspaper articles and magazine articles and I like, I like doing that. So I'm also like a little bit nervous of my career after this. Like once I show up to go interview someone and there's just like a whole book out with any, anything anyone might want to know about me, but it's, it's happening now, I guess. No, that, that makes sense. I mean, you being a historian, being a journalist, you have, uh, you have a subject that's outside of you and you're not a part of it and you don't want to make yourself too much of a part of it. Uh, it's about the other person. So that's, that's completely understandable. I was just wondering how, how you overcame that. Was it just your, your friends telling you that this was the better story? Because journalists like stories too. Uh, um, and yeah, this is the best story, the best story to tell. And you said you learned a lot about your family. Was that just from the interviewing? Um, for the process of the book or um... yeah so i initially went down there to learn about roy that's the mm -hmm. the country singer who grew up across the street from my grandma mm -hmm. and um i initially thought i would just roll into town and find i'd like roll up to the microfiche machine and there would be an article that was like baby stolen and i'd be like i'm done mm -hmm. but there's no such article the i didn't really realize this newspapers back in the 1920s 30s are really just about rich people and like the other rich people they visited and so there was not a, there was not actually a ton of news and mm -hmm. i realized like the only way to learn about roy was through talking to people mm -hmm. and i was a little bit nervous because it's a really conservative town and i look like i look and it's kind of freaky to just knock on people's doors and say like tell me about the local transgender person um, mm -hmm. So I started a lot with my family who, who knew Roy and would interview them and they a lot of times wanted to talk about themselves and um, but then and other family members would help me they would like run sound for me or they would put up flyers for me and, and kind of in the in between moments we we learned things or I would stay at my grandma's house and we'd stay up late in the carport talking and so was, a lot of it was just kind of incidental with stuff around the actual story and then when I sat down to write it this way, I had taped everything, so I had it all. And a lot of the stuff that I had dismissed as not a part of it be became more interesting to me. And interestingly, um, you know, my family has a lot of, their stories are are indicative of the South. Like like I said, they, they all pierced cotton. Um, to get back to Emily's book, my mother was an opioid addict and um, she passed away a couple of years from ago from it. And so the book gets into that a lot of like different times that my mom's on pain pills while we're trying to report this story. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of like a, a fruit salad of Southern issues, but, but it, it, there's the journalism to that too, even though it's no more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jessica, yes. your book deals with a very thorny issue, obviously. What's this? What's the problem? What do you think is the chief source of the problem with the refugee situation in the United States? I mean, we bill ourselves as a nation of immigrants. We like to see ourselves as welcoming of of people from other countries. Um, what's the source of the of this sort of disconnect between our image of ourselves and the reality that you're describing about uh, the difficulties that people have? Yeah, I think that's such a great question. And I, you know, when I began this research, I would have thought that the answer would be policy, right? So we need to change the political system. And I think for, 
now having done research and having talked to a lot of people, the answer is public opinion. I think something shifted in around 2015 and there are a number of factors. It was the end of kind of a post 9-11, it was like the whiplash tale of what had happened after 9-11. It was memes coming out of Europe as Syrians were crossing the border. I'm here in Texas. We like to think about this as a national thing. I felt like the locus was here. I felt like Austin was the beginning of it in many ways. So our mm -hmm. Texas governor and um, other figures here were kind of leading the charge, our senators in terms of rhetoric. Mm -hmm. um, when the refugee resettlement program passed in 1980, it passed the Senate unanimously. And I didn't believe that fact when I first read it because I just mm -hmm. cannot imagine an immigration bill passing the Senate. Mm -hmm. But it was so widely supported in the 1970s that when that came in 1980, it was like, a, and of course, this is what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. And for me, I, the thing that I have found is the image that we have of what it means to be a refugee and the reality of what it means to be a refugee are two different things. And so there needs to be um, really widespread, um, a public shift around the difference between refugees, economic migrants, asylum seekers, what the refugee resettlement program actually meant. I've had so many conversations, again, living here in Austin, I know a lot of people who just really hate refugees, mm -hmm. and I've had a lot of conversations when I describe to them, this is my friend Hasna, she wants to be with her kids, there was nothing, they had no choice, a missile hit their house, what are they supposed to do? It's an of course moment, and so I think mm -hmm. somehow if we can bridge the disconnect between those two things is what we need to do. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I mean, I don't expect you to have a total answer to this, but what is your opinion? What, what do you think happened? You, you're describing something like a, a like turning a corner or a snap uh, where people just all of a sudden shut off. I mean, what is, is it influenced by, well, you mentioned Europe, mm -hmm. um, the scenes of, of Syrians and after the Iraq war and sort of the domino effect of all of that, um, having a, you know, having a, playing a role in all of this, but, you know, surely are there, what are the sort of internal forces? Why were people able to capitalize upon you know, capitalize, capitalize upon sort of negative feelings in this way and sort of result in this sea change and understanding about all of it. I mean, is I it race? That, is it, is it, I mean, what is the, what do you think is the, the impetus I, for this? I think it's a combination of things. I don't think it's any one thing. And I think this has been such a staggering time for many of us in which um, conversations that felt like they were different tracks. I often think about how journalists or bloggers used to have like a tag. So it'd be like tag immigration or tag race. And I think we're recognizing that these conversations are so um, part and parcel of a much larger issue that's happening. So yes, I do think that this is racialized. I mean, we're seeing this in terms of the um, ban that happened under the Trump administration that predominantly impacted people from Africa and from the Middle East, right? Mm -hmm. And so race is certainly a factor in this. I think um, fears about um, there's a that we're in a very xenophobic moment. And mm -hmm. I think the economy is has it has somewhat to do with it as well. And so I think um, anytime we have economic fears and racialized, we have this racialized moment and we have all of these kinds of things that are meeting together. And I also think that there was such widespread, quiet, almost placid support for refugee resettlement in the, for, the first 40 years of the program. There was not a need for education because people across the political aisle were working well together in order to resettle people. And so I think it, it was a shock I felt shocked by this as someone who had known refugees for a long time, and I've heard this from a number of people. So I think it happened to hit at a time when there was not a great deal of like outcry on behalf of refugees. And I'm not sure that that's going to happen again. I, I think we've seen that in the last few weeks when the Biden administration announced that they might not meet that cap of 62,500. Boy, the refugee resettlement people have been speaking out and there has been such community outreach. And I think that you're seeing a community that is, um, and, and people that have really learned a lot and are ready to speak out on behalf of vulnerable people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, um, we know, I, you were describing this process of discovering the huge amount of, of uh, freedom suits that were filed during slavery much earlier than we think of. We know about St. Louis and Dred Scott and, and the wonderful program they have there with all of the freedom suits on file and so forth. Um, as you talk to, you talk about the family members that you've discovered, I mean, the descendants and the work that you've done on these suits themselves, 
Can you figure out why these particular families <laughs> were so, you know, so you know, active in this area? What was the what was the driving force? It was just the knowledge that other family members had done it because it seems like an extraordinary thing to, to have these particular families who just sort of keep this tradition of litigiousness alive uh, in this area. Well, it, it was an extraordinary challenge to slavery. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's the thing I realized as I was working on this research, mm -hmm. just how significant this challenge to slavery was Mm -hmm. um, in Maryland and in Washington, D.C. It, mm -hmm. it, these freedom suits put individual slaveholders on trial. Mm -hmm. um, they essentially had to defend their slaveholding. Mm -hmm. And it also, these freedom suits also put slavery writ large on, on trial. Mm -hmm. um, I, tr I think about these freedom suits in this way. They were like a public counterpart to the Underground Railroad, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Families who were successful managed to liberate dozens of family members over successive generations. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think these families in Maryland, beginning in Maryland, um, were uh, suing slaveholders for their family's freedom. Mm -hmm. uh, these were family-based efforts. And that's, uh, that's something that I did not realize at first, mm -hmm. just how significant um, these were as, as family endeavors that mm -hmm. crossed generations. And so that legal knowledge, that mm -hmm. um, capacity, that sophistication was passed down and spread and it, uh, um, and it led to successive freedom suits in Maryland and then in Washington, D.C., all the way to the Civil War. And so the, the point really is that from day one of the United States, slavery was being challenged by these families mm -hmm. as a matter of law. Mm -hmm. What were the basis of some of these uh, of, of these suits? I mean, how, I mean, you have to um, a mother freed, um, a mother who was right. free, or you know, Native American or whatever. What, how did what? Right. What was the basis of them? Of well, most some of, them? of the initial some of the initial freedom suits were based on ancestry, so they were initially brought by descendants of white women. And mm -hmm. the claim to freedom was that their white ancestor was free. Mm -hmm. But for the Queen family and the Mahoney family, they were descendants of women of color. And mm -hmm. their claim was crucial because they were saying that uh, their ancestors, uh, their ancestor in each case, had, uh, had been a free woman of color and had come mm -hmm. into the colony as a free woman of color, mm -hmm. uh, who then subsequently was enslaved. Mm -hmm. and, and this allowed these families really to introduce the whole question of slavery as a legal principle in, yes. in, uh, uh, in Maryland and in the United States and, and raise significant issues. Mm -hmm. So how, how did that fare? <laughs> well, um, they because I, su I suppose all of, many of them could have made the claim that at, uh, to the extent that they were kidnapped and they were brought into right. the United States uh, as free people and their mothers were free. Part of sequitur Vantrum, for people who don't know, slavery followed, you followed the status of the mother. You were what your mother was. Um, well, both the Queens and the Mahoney's cases were significant because they were claiming that their ancestor had set foot in England. And okay. therefore, ah. uh, mm -hmm. because she had been in England on English soil, uh, she was free under English common law. And the, the, the real battle here was over um, English decisions that rendered slavery uh, illegitimate, um, mm -hmm. odious in the law, mm -hmm. uh, incompatible with natural law. Mm -hmm. And so all of those debates over slavery were being uh, um, talked through in these court cases in Maryland. Mm -hmm. uh, now, later... Um, enslaved families brought freedom suits in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. based on a whole range of technical mm -hmm. um, violations of the law that mm -hmm. they, could, they could sue for um, uh, freedom if, if uh, um, a slaveholder did not, in fact, make good on a promise to manumit or on a deed of manumission, or because a will, the terms of a will were violated. 
So there were all sorts of ways that enslaved families could sue for freedom, and they did so by the hundred. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. I wanted to ask all of you, um, these are different topics. Um, they all require a great amount of investigation, a lot of legwork and so forth. What was the most difficult hurdle that you had to cross in doing this work? And any of you can jump in at whatever time. You get to a point when you think this is really a tough, this is really tough. I'm not going to be, you know, was there any point where you thought I might not get past this, or this is really, really hard for me to, this will be hard for me to, to work with a, a piece of material or whatever, or a piece of writing even. Uh, well, my first, go, ahead. go ahead. Nope. Go ahead. <laughs> On my first reporting trip back in 2009, uh, Roy's, best friend told me that he kept a diary every single day um like for decades and that his neighbor had stolen them all and i asked that man for the diaries every year for 10 years and he said no so the um returning to that man's house and asking every single year after he told me no was definitely my hardest part mm -hmm. emily you were going to say something that that would be tough that would be <laughs> That'd be terrible. Yeah, <laughs> golly. Um, I, I continue to struggle uh, uh, with the pandemic. Right now, I really feel like I'm up against a lot of roadblocks with things that are unopen and unavailable to me. So I'm, I'm doing what I can uh, from home. I'm researching as much as I can. I'm doing a lot of interviews mm -hmm. over Zoom mm -hmm. <laughs> and on the phone. Mm -hmm. um, but it has become frustrating. And I'm, I'm really ready to get back into get back into the papers and see what uh, and see what secrets are being hidden in mm -hmm. in the archives so I'm psyched to see those. Mm -hmm. Will? Well sure yeah one of the things I, I struggled with the most um, and all historians do is the silences in the archives. Um, the, the families that brought these freedom suits did not leave um, you know testimony uh, the, those legal records um, were not, uh, were, what, what happened in court, uh, literally in one of these freedom suits was not preserved. So the voices of the enslaved families um, were, were not present. But, you know, Charles Mahoney, who brought one of the most important freedom suits, this is a 12 year battle, legal battle. It goes through three jury trials and two appeals. And, um, even though his voice isn't present in those records, uh, those records record his physical presence. And um, literally, he was present for every deposition, every hearing. He was guiding this freedom suit, not the attorneys. And um, that I really struggled with how to um, bring his story to life in a way that would um, uh, that would illuminate his. His, fam his family, his determination, his courage, um, and his, his, uh, his effort uh, to liberate himself and others. Mm -hmm. um, and 12 years after uh, he gains his freedom, he purchases his daughter mm -hmm. uh, and frees her with a deed of manumission. Mm -hmm. So this is a 24-year endeavor. Mm -hmm. And how to... How to um, make it come alive uh, mm -hmm. was a was a great challenge, um, and I struggled mm -hmm. with that. Yeah, for me, um, these stories were, you know, the the policy research, as complicated as it was, um, was nothing compared to the the stories of the women um, that I partnered with. So Muna and Hasna have both been through massive trauma; they wouldn't mm -hmm. be here otherwise. These stories are so deeply precious and I was so afraid of doing damage and I was so afraid of um, hurting them, but also of messing up in some way. And so um, I, I almost, I kind of often use the metaphor of like a collage, like each layer of each detail of each paragraph was collaged on over several interviews. I have such a desire to make sure that the truth of what they've experienced came through, but also just recognizing that 
there's such deep urgency in this right now. Um, this, these are so ongoing, what's happening in Syria, the coup that just happened in Myanmar. I did an interview, I did a late night interview last night with someone from Myanmar and they are saying basically like, we don't know if we're gonna live until tomorrow, can you please get the story out? And so I have, um, for me, recognizing the, the depths of the urgency of, of this, this is not an issue, these are people, they're separated from their families, they just want to be together with their grandchildren. Um, that I think has been the hardest thing to both bring forth and also just to kind of live in the tension of that. Yeah, it's very intense. Well, thank you very much for this. We're gonna go take some questions right now uh, from the audience. Uh, this is a question for Emily. What role do you think the Sackler family should, should could play in those addicted to opioids? Oh, that's a great question. And I'm actually reading uh, Patrick Radden Keith's new book about the history of the, the Sackler family right now, which is great and I highly recommend it. In the 1970s, we approached the opioid epidemic of the time, which is primarily a heroin epidemic, with a federally funded situation where there were over 300 uh, drug treatment clinics open, offering anything from uh, methadone treatment, which is, of course, the, the only uh, FDA approved and actually still kind of like shady with the FDA right now, uh, at the time, uh, sort of opioid substitution therapy available at the time, as well as counseling, social services, therapeutic communities, and things like that. There were 300 of these clinics available in over 200 metropolitan areas across the country. And these were free or very, very low cost for anyone who needed uh, these services. You could just walk in and get them. Uh, Dr. Jerome Jaffe, who kind of lives up the street from me um, outside of Baltimore, he was in charge of this organization. It was called the Special Action Office for Drug Abuse Prevention, or SEODAP, out of the Nixon administration. And he oversaw the development and evolution of these uh, clinics uh, and uh, was sort of in charge of federally funding them. We had this situation where anyone could come into a clinic, receive the services that they felt were necessary for them. And as Jaffe put it, no one would have to commit a crime because they weren't able to get drug addiction services. That's an extraordinary moment, especially for the Nixon administration, my God. Mm -hmm. Those don't exist anymore. In 1973, the whole situation was basically shut down. Nixon had been effectively uh, reelected. Watergate was crushing down on him. He felt as though he had the drug situation under control. The French connection had been disrupted, et cetera. So he said, you know, bye, <laughs> to put my one-year-old daughter, bye to uh, this, this, this whole system of federally funded uh, drug addiction clinics. If the Sackler family's money was to be put to its best use, I mm -hmm. truly believe that those billions of dollars could effectively fund a situation just like we had in this country 50 years ago, run by Jerome Jaffe under SEODAP. If we had clinics where someone could walk in and find treatment, a variety of treatments, both uh, OST, opioid substitution therapy based and non OST based, whatever worked best for what they were looking for at that time. If we had that, that would be an extraordinary movement towards the public health of this country. Uh, but we don't. And the money that is coming out of these lawsuits, there are questions about where it's going to go and what necessarily it's going to fund. Um, I'm not in charge. I, I don't want to be in charge. Uh, but if I were, I would very much so be revitalizing the system that was in place 50 years ago. Uh, and, and, and Dr. Jaffe, whom, I, whom I've spoken to many times in the course of, you know, researching this book, he doesn't want to be in charge anymore either. He's, he's you know, approaching 90. But I, he, even he said, what we did 50 years ago was, was effective. And it would not be a bad idea to revitalize that program now. Mm -hmm. There's a question for Casey. As someone who grew up in the South, but doesn't live there anymore, what are some common misconceptions of the South that you've encountered and how do you address them in the book? Hmm, interesting. Um, well, I think that people are not the monoliths that we peg them down to be. Like most of my family members are like super MAGA and they, 
But then they also have things that they'll bend on. Like I have an aunt who is on Twitter and her Twitter handle is like MAGA 3000 or something. And like all of her tweets are about how much she loves Trump and how sexy he is. But then she like is constantly sending me like pro gay things or like asking me about my love life in like a very like loving way. And the people in Dohai, um, when I started this uh, book, it was like pre Caitlyn Jenner, like our understanding of transgender issues now is way different than it was when I started the book, but people mm -hmm. had like kind of a strange um, ease at talking about it. Like some of them were like, well, her, her mind just didn't match her body or um, people would get mad. Like uh, a lot of preachers would kick Roy out for not wearing a dress to church because um, mm -hmm. there are a lot of Pentecostal Pentecostal churches in the region and people would get mad and like go to the preachers and like fight for Roy to not have to wear a dress because they just kind of took it as this like this is who Roy is like it would just be wrong for him to be in a dress like what are you thinking and I think you know now we have this idea that everyone is just super hateful and and I think probably sometimes they do vote that way and maybe they would say that in a kind of broad way but when the political becomes personal they they are willing to, to bend on it. And I think um, probably most people suspected that I was gay when they, when I was in their living rooms, but they, they never, most of them didn't say anything bad and they were still quite friendly to me. Even like one woman who was Pentecostal was telling me about how you go to hell if you cut your hair. And she was like, well, your hair is really cute. I wouldn't wear it because I don't want to go to hell, but it is cute on you. <laughs> <laughs> so they, uh, you know, they're, they're just like a little bit more nuanced than we give them credit for, I think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The question for you, Will, how many of the freedom suits were successful? It's a great question. Um, more than 50%. So in Washington, D.C., of the cases where we know the outcome, more than 50% were successful. And there were more than um, 500 freedom suits in Washington, D.C., before the Civil War. In Maryland, I think the success rate was even higher, um, maybe 70%, because once a family succeeded, often the successive cases individually would, like dominoes, uh, come through the court. Um, slaveholders tried to interrupt that success. There's no question about that. And the book is really uh, about how the slaveholders um, and the enslaved are, um, are in this uh, battle over uh, over the law, over the meaning of the law, and over uh, freedom. Mm -hmm. What what did the if I may? What did the slaveholders do? I mean, I mean, you said that they fought against this. What did they try to get the laws changed? Did they bribe people? I mean, what what was their primary way of fighting back? Well, there certainly was intimidation um, uh, to file a freedom suit against an individual slaveholder to take him to court. Uh, or heard a court was quite a uh, quite a dramatic a challenge to their um, self understanding, mm -hmm. and no less a figure than Henry Clay, the uh, Secretary of State and presidential candidate. Um, he is sued by Charlotte Dupuy in Washington D.C., and he's his reaction is muted fury. You know, mm -hmm. so um, he eventually has her imprisoned, essentially in the D.C. jail. Um, to try to slow down um, matters. Uh, you know, I think some slaveholders in Maryland, I found evidence that they, at the first whiff of a freedom suit, before it actually were filed, um, intervened by selling the person to yeah. Havana, Cuba. You know, a, just immediate reaction, which was a, a threat and a lesson to everyone oh, around them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They also tried to change the law, and they did. Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, Jessica, what was the role of translators and interpreters in the reporting of the book? Yeah, you know, it, it's so hard, I feel like, to be up here and think about this as my book. This was such a deeply community-based effort. And so um, there was a woman that partnered with me. Her name is Amina. That's a pseudonym that she uses. And we're doing some other translation projects as well. And they could not have done any of this were it not for Amina, not just translating the language, but that um, deep contextual um, 
the kind of cultural translation, right? And so Hazma would begin a story and Amina would say, let me back up and tell you how we use this meal or what this means. And so her fingerprints are all over the book. Muna herself is a translator. And so it was such a joy. Muna and I have known each other for longer than a decade. And I was friends with her um, starting about six months after she arrived. And so it was a real joy for me to sit down with her in English and get to hear kind of the inside scoop of what had happened when she first arrived. I saw it from the outside, but to hear her tell her own version in her own voice, it was incredibly powerful. And my great grief is that um, because their families are in danger, Muna, Amina, and Hazna don't get to be centered with me in all of these. Mm -hmm. For Casey, um, I have a transgender child who sees their identity as gender fluid. Religion is not an issue for us because we're all atheists. My child will also go to university in Canada and probably live there. So I'm not as worried for their future as I might be if they continue to live in the US. But I'm curious to ask you how long you think it will take for Americans to move favorably towards transgender individuals as they have, as they have towards gay and lesbian Americans over the past decade. Oh, wow. Uh, well, I think, unfortunately, we're at a really dire time for trans people. There have been more than 100 bills introduced just in this last session against trans people, mostly trans kids. Um, there were 40 trans women killed last year, and the, we're already on pace to have the deadliest year for trans women of all time this year. So it, it's definitely a, a bad time in many ways for trans people. It feels in some ways to me like where we were in 2004 for gay rights, where you had 11 different states um, vote down same-sex marriage. I, remember I was living in Mississippi at the time, and it was 87% of people who voted against gay marriage. And I remember in the months after, I would just like everywhere I went be eyeing people, knowing that they didn't want me to ever get married and had like stood in line in the rain to ensure that I didn't get to marry people. Um, and it wasn't until 2015 that that law changed through a Supreme Court decision. So, I mean, I'm not a psychic fully, but um, so. I, but I, I would bet it's it's probably still a long ways to come. The good thing is probably that people know how to rally around these things now. Maybe, but a lot of times when things get really bad is when people get into action. But I think sometimes. In Roy's case, because he was the only person in his town, there was no concerted effort against him because people didn't even know to be concerted. There was nothing politicized about his existence. Mm -hmm. He was just their neighbor who played country songs and mowed lawns. But now people are so front and center that there's like an organized resistance to them. And I think that unfortunately that resistance is just beginning. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's, it's probably going to be quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time, but thank you all very much for a lively and illuminating discussion. I would remind people, as they, you've been reminded in the chat, to, that you can purchase books by these uh, wonderful authors, the, the Pro Lucas Prize winners, the books were out, uh, and the finalists uh, at Book Culture, uh, that's in the chat. Uh, thank you all for coming to this, and we will say good night. Thank, thank you, you so, guys much. so much. This is wonderful. Thank you.